And one of the things you hint at is that the reason, perhaps, that we're now that now Putin is on is grinning at you from every <laughs> every newsstand, and the reason we believe Russia is behind everything and everyone at the moment is because you think we're nostalgic for a kind of Cold War idea that Russia is the great other. The, I mean, you were saying something very interesting down there about the role that Russia plays in our fantasy lives. Could you talk about that? Well, that's what we're talking about downstairs. I mean, how many countries or how many cultures, political <coughs> cultures, culture cultures, can capture the imagination, capture the political imagination? And Russia is quite good at that. I mean, for all the stuff that Russia is rubbish at, like building a fair society, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> um, what, 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 what it's always been good at is grabbing the imagination. So you have that in 1917, you have that in the Cold War. And now again, this kind of essentially, you know, in many ways, very weak and flimsy country has, you know, it's not just our, it's not just sort of our paranoias, has managed to capture the moment and articulate it through its political spokespeople, through its media, and so on and so forth. So, um, and it's one about cynicism, distrust, you know, it's that, that whole sense that, that so many other politicians are now, are now sort of lapping up. So I think, you know, I, th I wouldn't, you know, the one thing Russia is very good at is culture in its broader sense. And, and I think there's a bit of that going on. One of my favorite sentences in your essay is that you say, you know, it's not just time of conspiracy theory, fake news, alternative facts. It's time of polarization where we, uh, what, what is the line? It's a brilliant line. We say, um, um, Can't talk to each other like we're yeah. spitting. Yes, yes. I actually really wanted we to re-enter that one. Yes, I thought it was a really bad one. Oh, it's such and a good line. And then it was final copy. It's the sort like, oh. of polar we've reached the sort of polarization where people can't talk to each other anymore without spitting. Yeah, that's <laughs> a bad line. <laughs> I, I think that's a bad great. Line. Well, that's a bad line. I realised that I've become socially phobic because I might spit at someone. Really? <laughs> but I, I realised that I have. Um, I think it's worse that. That I'm finding the social world yeah. more frightening than I ever had before. Yeah. And on the one hand, I need it more than ever before because I do need solidarity. I, I need to feel that I'm not completely isolated and alone. But it's a weird way to approach the world. I never mm. used to go into the world looking for solidarity more than anything else. Yeah. And I'm frightened of pe I'm, I'm frightened of my own politics, and I'm frightened of other people's politics. And I'm finding an that the m if we were to talk about politics, I'd, we'd wind up spitting. Uh, and 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 so I I. I I do want some hope, and I'm not getting... There, there are little hints of maybe where you could look... They're very dark hints for, of hope in your essay. But one thing you do say is, for a long time now, Russians have said, I just have to trust... We, I don't believe the words of anyone. I don't believe the facts. I don't believe anything. I have to go with my feelings and make my way through this fog mm. of disinformation. Yeah. You say, but how are they... So how, what is the survival strategy yeah. for this? That's, yeah, so that's definitely that's something that I would, I would hear in Russia in the early 2000s. I heard it in Donbass in the war a lot. Um, and then now I hear it from my upper middle class cousin in New Jersey, from people in Peterborough. The same set, it's literally word for word. There's so much information, disinformation out there. I don't trust anything. I'll go with my feelings, um, which is I mean, remarkable to hear that in, in, in the West. But um, um, so, no, I mean, it, things have got worse since, since the polarization bit. Polarization is we're still kind of talking to each other. So I was in DC during the, the Kavanaugh nomination. I don't know if you saw this. This, is a, this, this judge was being made into a, a grand judge, a big judge, grand wizard. No, <laughs> uh, a big judge, big judge, a big judge. And there was a lot of fighting about it because a woman came forward, very credible witness, saying this guy had sexually harassed me when we were students, but this was like 40 years ago, impossible to prove. And DC just became this kind of like, you know, this mad shouting match. But it weren't shouting at each other, you know. It had got so bad, they were like shouting at trees <laughs> and shouting at glasses. <laughs> shouting at each other, still, like, there's still kind of a, some sort of face-to-face -face there. It was just like the extent to which the two sides, and there were more than two sides, um, just kind of like had just completely different tunnels they were looking down. So the, 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 the kind of liberal tunnel was like, this is a sign of the patriarchy winning and everything very sensibly was analyzed through that. And then the conservatives, or what used to be conservatives I met, were saying, this is all a case of um, a, liber a liberal media attack, which it was. It was like, you know, it was actually engineered in a very, very sort of cynical way by, by some media players. Um, both those things were kind of true, but everyone was stuck in their own tunnel, and they weren't even just shouting at each other. They were just shouting into sort of an empty space past each other. You're saying that politicians these days sort of want to be caught out lying, that they lie and, and uh, so conspicuously and openly, 
as if they, as if being caught out, you say, is part of the point. And in, in the case of these guys, they're telling it. They're like those magicians who tell you how they do their tricks, and then do them, and the tricks still work. And you're not sure, but I've just been told how this happens, but it still works. Look, if you're just telling people what they want to hear, you know, if you're just like, if your message isn't to win them over with an argument, but just to work out, okay, what kind of what kind of story do I feed the academics in order to get them to vote for me? You're not going to do facts. You're not trying to win a, a deliberative argument. You're just trying to like, you know, feed them whatever they want to hear. Uh, you know, today we have the dynamics of social media, and there's been a fair amount of studies which seem to confirm some of this. That you know, people go to social media not to have a deliberative debate, especially Facebook. They go there to have, you know, to have a little ego boost from likes and shares. Uh, in order to do that, you take up the most extreme position in your little social group, and and so you know. Facts go out the window. You're just trying to say anything that pleases people. Um, so there's that. So I think that's kind of like, you know, the political logic already suggests that facts aren't very necessary. But like, facts are horrible. I mean, facts tell you you're going to die. Facts tell you that you're, like, you're over 40. Facts tell you that, like, you know, that, that you're overweight. Um, my case. But, but um, facts are not nice. I mean, why would we want facts? Um, so, so the idea that politi politicians would give us facts is kind of surreal. Um, I think facts are just quite useful if you're proving something. I mean, we, we don't have a fact-free com conversation when it comes to building a bridge. You know, suddenly, everyone's really, really precise about all their measurements. You know, it's not like you don't have any kind of bullshitting around that. So if you're trying to prove something, trying to build something, then facts are very necessary to prove that you're getting there. Um, but if you're a society which has no idea of the future anymore, whether it's Russia in the 1990s or now, or increasingly us, then then pol politics isn't about proving things anymore. It's not about an evidence-based argument, which you then win or lose. Uh, it's about a whole host of other things. And I think there's some sort of libidinal release in saying fuck off to facts. I think uh, maybe at some very pretentious level, and scary saying this in the LRB bookshop, where half the people here are psychotherapists. I mean, <laughs> some sort of release from death, I think. So like, you know, the biggest fact is death. And so Zhirinovsky in the 1990s, there was a pleasure in this. Oh my God, he just said that. Wow, nothing matters. And I think with Trump, there's a kind of a punk-like release from factuality, which is which comes, which which you know gives you some sort of pleasure.